Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, this is our biggest event yet. We had 150 RSVPs. I don't think we have 150 people here, but uh, we're really excited. I'm going to turn it over to Kurt. So just to get started, um, Wi-Fi code, if you haven't already put it in, uh, WM1025. Our website, bostonwp.org. If you haven't taken a look recently, we've made a bunch of changes. Um, new format, um, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, we're on the Twitter, BostonWP, and our hashtag tonight is WTFNerd. <laughs> so first off, uh, Does anybody need help? <laughs> All right. So if you, guys have, if you guys have any questions whatsoever about anything, just send us an email at help at bostonwp.org. Um, we may not get back to you right away. Excuse me? My car is making a Send us an email. Um, we may not get back to you right away. Uh, it might take us some time to do some research, but um, we'll try and answer it in a little while. Uh, also pertaining to the website. Um, we also have a forum section, which is uh, currently in use. Um, you could also use that if you guys have any other questions about WordPress. We also have a jobs posting section, um, where you can post any jobs that you need or have for other people. Um, it's great to try and meld the community together, which brings up the next slide, WordPress in the community. Um, I don't know if you guys know, we are the third largest WordPress, formal WordPress meetup in the country. Uh, <coughs> shouted by Dallas, Fort Worth, and New York. So a uh, big thanks to you guys. Um, but we do need help from you guys. Um, we want you guys to send us ideas. Um, we want you to rate speakers, um, rate the meetup, and if you can, promote us. And if you are willing to volunteer, send us an email. We're always looking for help. And finally, upcoming camps. So uh, Design Camp Boston is coming up November 6th, which is a Saturday. There are five slots left, so if you want to go register. Yes. Just okay. um, Also, there's also a 2010 Women's Leadership Forum, which is actually hosted here at NERD. Um, it's also co-sponsored by Mix. So the, the event bright is Mix Nerd, Mix Nerd Women's Forum, eventbrite.com. Um, Register. Yes. I don't know. Free. Is it free? Yes. It, it is free. There are, it, it says it's sold out, but there, I think there are five slots left. If it's not, just send us an email and, and we'll try and resolve that issue. Can you just repeat the hashtag one more time? WTF nerd. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Actually, uh, one, one quick thing. So we did um, a workshop a couple months ago. Just a show of hands, who would be interested in any kind of hands-on workshop here, whether it's beginner or advanced, like coding or anything? Wow. Okay. Wow. We will definitely right. do another one of those. Yes. We'll let you know. Cool. I'm James Coletti, by the way. This is Kurt Eng. We're the co-organizers, so if you have any issues, definitely come talk to us. And uh, without further ado, uh, I want to introduce our speaker tonight, Chris Brogan. Um, if you don't know who he is, pick up his book, Trust Agents, and give it a read. Well, thank you. Hi. Yeah, there was a blank hashtag, so we decided to co-opt that and make it WTF Nerd. Uh, if we can make that trend tonight, that would be very useful, people of Twitter. Um, I didn't bring slides or anything like that, and part of the reason I didn't is because there's such a diverse gang here, and so one of the things I wanted to make available, oh no, how do I do that? Like that, that's how. I know how to use the technology. Is I figured that we could do some show and tell if we need to, but otherwise I won't. Oops, first I have to mush it down a little, don't I? You mush that for me a little while I do it, because Kurt's smarter than me. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris Brogan. I apologize for my voice. I'm on the other side of a cold, the hopefully you don't get it side. Um, I've been blogging since 1998, back when it was called Journaling. The first software that I used was a WYSIWYG editor software called Trellix, which was made by this guy, Dan Bricklin, who invented VisiCalc. When I first ever met him, I kind of blew Dan's mind by being, you invented Trellix? And he was sort of looking at me like, you're the one dude who never said VisiCalc first. And so like we bonded a little. We're not exactly BFFs, but you know, hey, 
way back in the way old days, one day Trellix contacted me because they thought I had figured out blogging software. But what I was doing was, I was using something like Excel for, for WYSIWYG website editing. And on the left I'd put the date, on the right I'd put my blog post, and every day, day I'd go to write a new post, I would cut and I'd paste it, and then I'd start again. And after I explained to them my process, they were like, oh, that's what Dan does. And they hung up. So that was like my brush with dot com glory. Right there, it just came and went. Uh, I feel like I'm at an AA meeting, because you know, then I went into Blogger, and then I went to this other software, and then I went to WordPress, and I've been on it ever since. Hallelujah. Um, I'm not especially religious about the back end of software. I, I'm, a, I'm a pragmatist, because I run businesses, and so my business isn't getting excited about the back end. It's about, did something happen? And uh, ultimately, did a cash register ring somewhere? Because that's how I get my wings. So, um, by the way, can you emulate the sound that the car is making? I think it really help. I, mean, I figure we're right in the same neighborhood as car talk. We might as well just get it out of you. Yeah. Um, let me show you my site just so you, you know, don't think I'm lying to you. I run a site. We all do, don't we? See, again, it's a kind of a, it's a kind of lie that we admit stuff. There we go. So I run, a, I run a fairly basic WordPress site. My site is basically a, a site talking about what I'm calling the human business, which is beyond social media. Uh, there's a lot of people who want to know about blogging and Twitter and podcasting and video blogging and all that. So accidentally, uh, I fell into the world of marketing. I used to be a tech guy. I used to you know climb underneath floorboards and build data centers. And over time, Advertising Age decided I'm in their top five. So I'm almost always at number two or so. I'm always fighting it out with like Copy Blogger and Seth Godin. So there's days I wish that they'd get a horrible cold so I could pass them, but it's not today. The real best way we can use our time is if you think up really good questions to ask me and they will very likely not be, you know, how do I get the comma to line up with the other thing? Because I'm not good at that. That's a Jim Spencer question. Um, the, what I'm good at is I'm pretty good at getting content to work and I'm pretty good at getting um, people to do my bidding. I sort of run an evil empire. So for example, this post I put this morning has 164 comments on it. On an RSS readership of 68,000 or so and on a face-to-face -face readership of about 10,000 or so a day. 12,000 or so. 300,000 uniques. So I'm not a very huge site, but I'm also not a very small site. Um, I have way more RSS subscribers than I have daily subscribers to my site uh, or, or daily web traffic. That's because I don't rate for anything especially good, you search engine types. I rate for things like, no, I don't sleep, and grow bigger ears, and you're doing it wrong. Uh, which, by the way, it's really hard to make a business out of rating for you're doing it wrong. Uh, so it turns out. So the way I sell business is I run a couple companies. One of them is a marketing company where I sell to big, huge Fortune 100 slash 500s like General Motors and PepsiCo and those kinds of folk. They're lovely um, and they have money. And then the other thing I'm doing is I have a new company called Human Business Works, which is doing education for uh, small business people because I just got sick of saying, I can't help you. I don't have anything for you. So I made an online education company because it seemed fun to run two companies at once. That was brilliant. Uh, I also am an uh, entrepreneur in residence at Crosstech Ventures. And so one of the other things I'm working on is a live video station called The Pulse Network because who needs sleep? And I figured it'd be kind of fun to try something that's failed for several years in a row, like internet video stations. So why don't we do that again? Uh, I also stay chocolatey in milk. <laughs> True? Come on, people. <laughs> um, my goal with talking a little bit about content is, is just to sort of explain that once you get the gadgetry down and once you try to figure out the best possible this or that, what you're really trying to do is get people to come back for a reason and you want them to keep repeating for a reason. And things have changed a great deal. One of the things that's changed in the, in the format is that size matters but in the other direction as opposed to the rest of the internet. Uh, what I find is that people who are coming from a writing background, for instance, are writing vast tracts of prose, you know, 7,000 word missives and things like that, saying, gosh, I remember when the New Yorker would run these kinds of pieces and they won't, so I will. 
And, you know, all 11 of your readers are so grateful that you're carrying that torch. But if you want a lot of readers, then you're going to have to switch to brevity, which is what we, the Twitter crowd, seem to have forced on the earth. You know, and a really interesting thing, if you, if you take a video of TV from the 80s, and you put it on a screen, and you put the screen facing the wall, and you watch the flashes of light when they do cuts, you know, from one video angle to another, and then you watch any modern TV show, it's like several hundred cuts to every one of a video. Okay, you guys with me? So like, this is the shot, and then this is the shot. Well now it's like, super fast. We're all tuned for that. We are the ADD nation. So when we set up our sites, when we're setting up our blogging, when we're trying to make interesting content, we've got to tune it for the ADD nation. So even though you sat down and took a lot of time to think it out, that's not how it's being consumed, right? How many kids with ADD does it take to change a light bulb? <laughs> Let's ride bikes. <laughs> it's my friend Heidi Miller's joke. I once got a cease and desist letter from the ADD Association of America uh, when I made that joke. Number one, what? Like, <laughs> how could they even get together and form a group? <laughs> and then two, I wrote him back, I'm like, yeah, whatever, you'll forget about that in like a week. <laughs> and then I got sued. <clears throat> That's okay, I sent it to my lawyer as part of the Dyslexics Association of America, so we wrote him back something that said W-L-R-O-P-F-L. <laughs> Dyslexia joke. Uh, <clears throat> so, in writing content, there's a few things that I do all the time. I try to write all my content that starts with a human bend. One of the first things I'm trying to do is get you into it. The other thing I'm trying to do is dissuade you from thinking that I'm the expert, just like I've done in this presentation. There's no one in this audience now thinking, he must know something. Um, I do that on purpose. I try to take away that sort of sense that I know everything and you don't, because guess what? No one interacts with you if that's the setup you made. Uh, I co-founded an event called PodCamp, and it's based on the BarCamp model. It's an open media thing. We actually had it at Nerd here a couple months ago. Any PodCampers in the group at all? I love you. Um, we did it because at the bar camp event, this guy put up his hand. It was at the Monster headquarters, I remember it well, in Maynard. And this guy put up his hand. He goes, I am such and such, and I helped develop the Java kernel. And I know more about Java than any of you in the room ever will hope to know. And we're all like, OK. We're not going to your thing. <laughs> so we just hung out in this, you know, the a lobby and made podcasts together. Um, people hate to think that you're the god, and they're not. Which is really funny because we as writers try to think, well, we, should, we have to be the authority. We should know everything and they shouldn't know anything. Guess what? People love to add their opinion to your piece. We're an opinion world, aren't we? I mean, fewer people vote for the president than vote for who dances better. I'm blown by this, but it's true. I met somebody the other day, by the way, who was the winner of something called Big Brother. I don't have TV at home, so I always think people are joking when they tell me about what a show means or what it is. And I was just kind of stunned because I didn't know that Big Brother was kind of like Survivor, but they don't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so I was like, so you, how did you, like you won by just not getting beat up or something? And he was really deflated by the time I was done with him. I'm like, that's okay, I'm just a, a nerd typist. You know, what are you gonna learn from me for? With content, I do the same thing. I try to, I try to deflate the ego of my own. And I try to come up with ideas that might be useful. I break it up with with, sight, with you know simple you know, uh, header text in the middle. Sometimes I use bullets because bullets are evil in photo in uh, PowerPoint, but they're not bad on a blog. And I try to end with something at the end. In this case, I just said, "Hey, you know, was that useful? What else can I answer?" And then I, as I started to realize that this one was going to blow up, I just stuck a note to get my newsletter because I really wanted more subscribers. It has nothing to do with the post. <clears throat> Absolutely nothing. I just was raping and pillaging it for business. Um, that's a content trick too. Should you find the blog post that's going to do way better by mistake than what you thought it would do? Fill that full of whatever you really want them to do with your life. I'll show you an example of that somewhere in my blog. And again, if you don't come up with questions in the next little bit, you're going to be so depressed. Well, right away. Go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> How do you keep from repeating topics? I don't. I love repeating topics. Why? Um, because people keep coming back. So there's always the um, Seth Godin. Seth Godin says it's always September somewhere. You know, there's always some new recurring group of people coming back to school. 
there's always somebody coming into this going, oh my gosh, you wrote about Twitter? <laughs> you know? Meanwhile, every other person who's ever read a blog in the last several years is like, stop writing about Twitter! Um, this one was from August 20, 2008. It is still one of my top written posts. So, uh, hey, look, an ad. Look, another ad. Keep giving me money, baby. <laughs> and then there we go. What was the ad? It's about guest posting. Um, you're a guest I'm a huh? What? Guest yeah, so I didn't write it, but this really good guy, Chris, did. Not me. Uh, what are we in? Chrome? Hang on one second. I'll explain that one to you in a minute. Uh, power or something. 50 power Twitter tips. So I wrote. Jeff's question was, why write about something twice? So I wrote it again, June 16, 2010, 50 power Twitter tips. All new, but I also linked back to the old post in case you hadn't got enough of me. <laughs> Stuff for lad. Um, by the way, lists, numbered lists, are <coughs> sadly and depressingly always gold. Always, always, always gold. 13 things that give you gas would be an incredible list. <laughs> I, you think I'm joking, but it's true. One of my favorites like that, 27 blogging secrets to power your community. Why 27, you might ask? That's odd. <laughs> <laughs> Math joke. Um, so, you know, why not 27, right? I, you know, it just seemed like a number, and uh, I've done it this way a million times. Nine such and suches. And why don't you add the 10th? Oh, 150 comments, because everyone's got a 10th one in mind, right? These are tricks. They're ridiculous tricks, and they work every damn time. Every time I put up a post with a number, it works. My friend. If somebody were to do a search, they probably wouldn't be searching on 27. They'd probably be searching on top 10 or something. So, True. Right? So are you actually... So I'm competing with all the top 10s of the world? So I'll stand out, because I have terms like blogging secrets. So I'm actually competing on the words by tricking your brain with the number. Uh, the other thing that happens really exceptionally well with numbered lists is because you know in your head you can't maintain more than seven things. And that's stretching it for some of you as I've observed. Um, <laughs> you bookmark that. The minute you bookmark that it shows up and say delicious. The minute it gets really high and delicious it goes to delicious popular which throws it to pop earl who suddenly spreads it all over the globe and a bunch of robots start tweeting it out and I am godlike. <laughs> Just because you can't memorize more than seven things, you monkeys, uh, right? But these are tricks, and, they, and yet they work, and it's depressing that there's tricks and that they work. And, you know, other things are lists of lists. My best advice about blogging takes you to a post full of posts about blogging. That's recursive. 27 of my best list posts. You know, that would be kind of fun, wouldn't it? So when you're talking... Oh, yeah, no, when it's, you're it's church. When you're something like this, <laughs> yeah. how, do you, how would you, like, that last example there, the best of, how would you, um, how would you tag it? Well, folks, anonymists of the world, I don't tag anymore. And one of the reasons I don't tag anymore is because I've yet to find any great search results come out of tagging. It's how you pull that, you should do it. Um, I'll give you an example, is that Turner has a bunch of uh, videotape in a room that the only thing that they have is the label on the tape to know what's on the tape. Meanwhile, across the pond, uh, what's it, IGN? Whoever, one, not the BBC, but the other one, has all this content that they've, they've done like micro-analysis on and they have all the data tagging. And so I can get this kick that Beckham made against that guy and they can sell it at those tiny little bites. So you do want great folks on me for the back end of content management. Um, for the front end, for the people looking for stuff, unless I do something to reveal that in an interesting way. Like if I had really been smart, I would have made something called best of and not had to edit this page manually a real lot of times, but I am not that smart. Um, with WordPress 3, this is, oh God, I can't, at least I'm talking to WordPress nerds. With WordPress 3, uh, categories have suddenly replaced tagging as being you know, slightly more important than it used to be. But I've yet to do anything to make it easy for you to find stuff on my website which is why I have a crappy bounce rate. Um, how I would tag the best of might be something like uh, promotional or something. I mean, I would try to tag it in some kind of a, you know, that this doesn't mean anything or that this, you know, this doesn't uh, in itself drive attention. 
but then it's a it's a bucket for things. But then I would tag those other things, blogging and how to and whatever, and I would try to do both because you know the same person wants how to, maybe wants the and the SEA how to and not just blogging. And so, you know, for example, my category of video blogging has book reviews, but it also has hotel reviews and things like that. So it's a good librarian question. Who are you writing for? Is it a segmented audience? You know, or do you write for yourself? Do you write for persona? Oh no, that's a really good question. Who do to whom do I write? Uh, I write to uh, mostly my competitors. I write mostly to marketer types who want to connect and figure out ways to do better marketing. And what I do is I try to equip them with tools so that I won't have to go do every job for them. And that the ones that are left over, the ones that are like, oh, this still seems tricky, we better pay somebody. And that's a way to kind of cut out my buyer. Um, but I also charge a lot, which also cuts out buyers. So when you do those two things, and you know, suddenly the phone doesn't ring and you have time, you can think, you can water the plants, and you can walk and stuff like that, it's amazing. Um, but no, I, I write to people who are trying to figure out business. What I'm trying not to write to is, a, is the marketer themselves, the CMO or the director of marketing, because uh, they're boring. They're so not interesting. And when you go to conferences with them, they're shiny and they use lots of exclamation points, but they're not really interested in the bottom line. And whereas I like to really make revenue, I like to talk to people who like to make revenue. So I, I try to talk to the business owners or the business managers. So I, they sneak in and what they do is, I find that my audience tends to be business owners or business leaders who then beat their marketing team over the head with this blog, which makes me very cheery. So the spirit of number this. Sure. Top five, seven things I do to accelerate the traffic to my site. One is I would try to be really, uh, I make sure my site's very accessible. I would do things to make sure that it's really easy to subscribe. God, I should just stand at the podium a little. I hate podiums. So right there, that delivered daily is the most obvious visual element on my site besides my own head. Um, <laughs> stick your email in there and I will make sure I get you in my site. So 59% of my uh, site subscribers come through email which I found interesting. I also skew a little older than most sites. My site starts at 30 something on the average and gets into the 60s or so, which I, of which I'm very proud, which is also why my font is bigger than a lot of these other blogger sites. Um, the other things I do to get more traffic to my site is I write content that other people can use for themselves. I try to write useful content because if you write about yourself or you write about your opinions, then people stick around once and go, oh, he doesn't like that. Yeah, me neither. And then off you go. But if I write, and here's how you could have fixed it, you know, 14 things the t TV industry could do to keep me instead of letting me go off to Hulu. You know, if I were writing for the TV, I'll tell you what, I'll, the post I'm gonna do now, I'll tell you, most of my blog posts serve either you or they serve me, and the one that's gonna serve me is, I just had to stay in a hospital, and I was, I was, my mind was blown at just how inefficient everything is in a hospital and how badly it's run and how absolutely against me it was run. To the point I was having this amazing conversation, like, you know, if you just walk off the property, uh, they won't cover your stay. I said, what's that, like 27,000? I'll get that I'll get that one back. And they're like, what? I said, I'll speak to all your industry. Over the next couple of years, I charge 25 grand a speech, one speech, and I'm out two grand for the stay. It sounds like a deal to me. You wanna, you wanna discharge me or do you want me to leave? Okay. Um, but that's, but that's entirely true, that story's entirely true. So the other thing is I write about industries that I think I have a chance at changing and I write about them hopefully intelligently that I can change them. I didn't mean to stand this on a photo of my head, by the way, I had a point. It's roughly the same shape as the existing head. Um, the other thing I like to write is I write, uh, I try not to write uh, news topical pieces. One of the reasons is they go old so fast, you know, making an I'm not a witch joke is not gonna be useful next year. That's all I did this year. Go Delaware. Um, the people who write news topical stories about you know this new plugin coming out for Chrome, one, it's a hugely compacted market, and there's just way too many people all going to the same four blogs and reiterating it. Who cares? Uh, but if you're the one person telling the auto industry how to do something with the new plugin for Chrome, and they kind of go, oh. Well, then you got something. So I write for my buyer. I write for the person who I want to speak to or do consulting work to. And I tend to try to write to uh, people, like I said, who could put me out of business. 
the other things I do to get more traffic is uh, I have guests posted on a lot of other places. I write for American Express right now, which has been really useful, and I write for uh, Entrepreneur Magazine, the print one. That's really useful because they don't read blogs. Um, and I don't know, I show up in a couple other weird places. I was going to show you something on the uh, About page about content. One of them is that I put all my disclosures on my About page. This is one that's required by the FCC, so if you're selling crap and not disclosing, you're kind of in violation of a federal rule. But otherwise, it also allows me to get around the question of how are you making money off me and how do I know you're making money off me? Well, because I explain where I'm making money off you. So one of the things of which I am an affiliate is with Chris Garrett's guest posting ebook, which is all over the front of the site. Chris writes a really pretty decent book for 17 bucks, although there's evidently typos in it. Someone wrote me back and complained and goes, there's typos. I said, yeah, no kidding, huh? If you think that information is not worth 17 bucks, just hit me. I'll get you. I'll get you your 17 bucks back. But it's like, here's something to make you thousands of bucks. Oh, look at that. They spelled wrong, wrong. <laughs> that must be poopy data. Chris, you know. what, what criteria do you use to evaluate if the guest post is worth, you know? I don't take them on my site. But uh, if if other people want to write a guest post, I guess what I'm looking for is. You know, is it not an ad for your blog? Is it something of content that's actually valuable? Like, for example, if I wrote something for Mashable, it's usually something that actually fits into what other Mashable readers would want, and it's just not worth it to stick it on my site because I don't write to that crowd. Um, I also look for, is it somebody of some kind of attention that would be worth it? But that's, that's kind of what everybody does. They kind of look for the biggest name, the guest poster. I want the different, I want the opposite. I want the up-and-comers because that's the real community and that's where the real value will come. And you know, the people giving other people a shot at that, that's growing the community. And to me, that's where the real, the real meat comes out of. So why don't the big marketing uh, organizations like Coca-Cola and Coca-Cola get this right? Um, because they keep falling back on themselves. The question, why don't big marketing companies get this right? They keep falling back on bottom line type issues, and they keep talking to their agency of records. So an agency of record is trying to say to them that if you spend five million bucks and we shoot confetti out of a cannon and get some people in underpants to stand around with your soda pop, you're gonna sell lots of it. And if I said, that seems really weird, if you gave me like 50,000 bucks, I would do this for like a whole year, they're like, oh, well that sounds pretty good. But the guy who's charging the five million has a lot of incentives to keep me out of the, the mindset of the Coke guy. What happens instead is I have to show interesting revenue opportunities or lead generation opportunities. It's, it's awful hard with consumer soda pop, for example. I just took on a company, I don't remember if I'm supposed to say their name, but they're small and they're trying to break into the energy beverage market against things like Red Bull. Uh, and they do, a, they do a really delicious all natural 25 calories a can kind of cola product that acts like Red Bull, which tastes very delicious with bourbon, I found out. <laughs> Doing a little testing of my own, because you know, Red Bull and vodka, I just wanted to see does this work with Buffalo Trace, and the answer is yes, it does. And if anyone wants to come up to Northern Massachusetts, I'll, I'll give you a free sampling of both bourbon and energy drinks. Uh, but what I found is that, you know, traditional marketing, and again, remember, I'm not from that world, I fell in by mistake. Uh, it seems to be based on a lot of like, so that just sold something. And you're like, really, where's the numbers on that? Well, we have these things that somebody, we commissioned them a long time ago and that proves that that sold something. And I come along, I'm like, really? It's really weird because I just see a wiggling hand. And they're like, yeah, well. And I'm like, hey, look at that link. I'll show you how many times something sold something and this is how many times it didn't and this is how much energy I captured. And they're like, what? Basic math? I'm like, yeah, I only know basic math. I can't even multiply very well. And you know, so it's kind of frustrating doing our world, but. And then there's SEO guys who are like the other side of that, like you know, pay-per-click guys. Give me two thousand bucks, and I'll turn it into four thousand bucks over and over again all day. That's what the pay-per-click guys do. Oof, tricky world. I call it throwing fish because you know it's one of those jobs that you know if you can do it really well, you can make lots of money. But it can't be any more fun than just throwing fish. So I'm somewhere in the middle. I try to make content that's useful and that makes money for people, and that hopefully you know, God willing, it pays all the bills. I wanted to show you another thing I did on my site because one of the things I sell is professional speaking. I, I have a whole site full of crap about me speaking. But if you notice, one of the things I do right away is I put calls to action right away early on in the thing. 
one of the things I see in a lot of people's sales pages, you gotta go all the way to the bottom to find what you want. My bottom's just full of delicious content, which sounds wrong out of context, doesn't it? <laughs> these, these are the jokes. Um, but what you do is, you know, first off, I call, talk about myself in the third person all over that page, which helps me with SEO. Because if I just say I, well, what good's that? I don't want to rank for I. It turns out there's a few other people trying for that one. Um, the other thing is, you know, I try to make sure that people understand who I am because I want to discredit people who don't, who I don't want to work with. You know what I mean? I want them to know I, I think I'm funny, and I want them to know that I'm a bit off the cuff because I work with the audience. I don't just say the same crap all year long. So, which a lot of pro speakers do, which is terrifying to me. So what I do is I just kind of blew through kind of what my speeches are. And then I stuck a couple of videos. By the way, right there where I'm standing, this is just totally anecdotal, has nothing to do with anything. Martin Luther King gave a speech to people in that very same spot. It was in Orange County, California, uh, at, at Chapman University. The guy who was running the sound system tells me that like 15 minutes before I'm going to speak. I sweat like crazy. I was like, sweet zombie Jesus, I'm a typist. Don't say that to me. I'm like some nerd. This guy was like fighting for freedom. I'm fighting for fonts. <laughs> You know, and I put a bunch of video on, which all I found out is that my French and Irish heritage shows my hands moving in every single video. If I had sock puppets, it would be so much more interesting. But so anyway, but again, my call to action, that gives you a real sense of who I am, but it also kind of, I'm always trying to discredit buyers. I'm trying to get, or, or, or disqualify buyers. I don't want my time wasted by people who don't want to spend it on me. And I don't want people to buy the wrong thing. You can do the same kind of thing with your sites. You can do the same kind of things with your blogs. As much as you want to tell yourself that you want everybody, you really don't want everybody. Scott Monty from Ford always says that his market is anybody who drives a car. But I don't think that's really true. Because there's a lot of people who drive leftover beaters and that's not what Ford's trying to sell. And there's people that maybe think a Segway is still cool, despite recent issues. Uh, talk about a PR problem. <coughs> and I think that you know there's a lot of people who are you know, that don't really fall into your sales thing. And I just get that out of the way with content. You know, I, you know, you can sense pretty quickly I'm not the guy, the kind of guy you bring home to mom. I don't, you know, I don't put the tie on. I don't sit at the suits with, you know, 25 other executives around me. When we go into a meeting, we go in there with a bunch of paper and we draw pictures with them. You know, we're, we're showing them things with colorful pictures and they're kind of like, well, that's awkward. He's drawing, you know. So I just try to get that out of the way first. You can do the same with your business. Any other content questions? Because otherwise I'm just going to ramble. Um, you are a commodity yourself that you appear to be trying to sell. How do you suggest somebody who has a product go about the same thing? Should should we separate our product from ourselves? Should we blog as ourselves? Uh, should we blog as the business owner? That's a great set of questions. Uh, I think Billy Mays before he died would have said that you should sell yourself and the product. Um, Billy Mays made a business out of selling products that he thought were, you know, valuable to people. I personally like when you go to YouTube and you look for the Billy Mays dubs, where they make kind of funny dubs out of them. You can still watch those and be respectful of Billy. I think it always has to be both. And again, you know, bear this in mind, I run a company called Human Business Works. If I'm selling Pepsi for somebody, I'm selling that I'm part of the Pepsi experience at that point. You know, kind of like Brittany and Michael and all those guys, only none of my hair burned. And I didn't have a weird problem with, you know, K-Fed. Um, I think that it's sexier to sell a product with a person, but I think you still, have, at the end of the day, want to push the product. I mean, I sell a WordPress theme called Genesis, and I, and I push it pretty hard because I think it's a really useful WordPress theme. But people don't buy it because they think the theme is amazing. People buy it because I said they think the theme is amazing. You know, so I think that once you get to that level with people that they understand and trust and believe in you, they're always going to believe in you more than they're going to believe in a product because every product falls apart at some point. Toyota has the most loyal buyers in the world. I was doing a survey for Toyota, not on their behalf, just on mine, of, you know, well, a whole bunch of cars stopped working and in the brakes in the gas department, which turns out to be two of the most important parts of your car. Uh, informal survey, that one. Um, I said, so, <laughs> as a Toyota owner, what are you thinking? And they're like, I love my car. I'm fiercely loyal to my car. I love this car. Would you buy a new one right now? Well, not right now, you know, but maybe again. And uh, I was kind of blown by that. But the thing is, you know, we're loyal to, we're loyal to things and we want to kind of show them something. But we're always most loyal to people, uh, as long as the people show loyalty back. 
interestingly enough, I was most recently with Toyota when the news broke about the Volt having a little bit of a fuel problem, like as in it uses fuel where they said it didn't. And Toyota was like, ha ah ha. And I was kind of like, oh, go ahead, throw some stones, Toyota. It's amazing how those industries are. I think Zen Master Ziggy could have a future in teaching Toyota how not to be catty. Um, you know, I sell things that aren't me. No, I don't. I just sell me. I was going to show you one of my other sites just really quickly. And it's got a giant picture of my head right now because we didn't know what else to put there. So look, I sell me. That's my office. Remember I was talking about the scotch? Look in the background. There's scotch and bourbon. Just tons of it. And superhero things. What I was going to point out is that when I decided to launch this company, I decided to put another giant picture of my freckly Irish human head up because people said, oh, this is a Chris Brogan project. I'm willing to believe in it a little bit more because it's this. This product project won't be different than something like U Phoenix, but without college credits. And it won't be that different from some of these like get rich quick, quick guys that write the crazy weird fake ebooks that look like real books and you buy them for 700 and something dollars and they're gonna change your world, but except it will be much less money and it'll have my funny head on it. Um, but I, what I do is I just leverage what I already had. So again, it's a product sale. I'm selling online communities as a product sale. And, and the goal was to, to, how do I make the transition? And what I just did was you know, hinge on me. Uh, when I work for other companies, that's tricky because you know, General Motors doesn't want me to be the face of Camaro as much as I keep asking to be. Um, so you know, I just do other things for that. You know, but yeah, I've got, I made kind of a business out of sticking my head on other people's websites. Oh look, we took my head off of it. How convenient. But I don't know if you walked if you walked in just a little you know page or so, you'll probably find my head again or something. Oh no, look at that, I'm all the way down the bottom now. See, there's my dumb head again. But uh, you know, there's something to it by the way. Humans, when I talk about making content, by the way, putting pictures on your site is really useful. Putting your picture on the site is very useful. Uh, humans since birth are trained to look at heads. Uh, think about it, when you're born, we're looking for milk and sustenance. So actually we're trained to look about 18 or 19 inches below a head, which by the way explains male behavior very well, doesn't it? <laughs> But that's really the deal. You know, as a human, we're looking to make out faces. That's how we do it. We're in a crowd of people. We make out faces out of the crowd of things or the items or whatever. We try to do a lot of eye contact. Why aren't you doing that on your blog? And if you're not, you know, look, look to add some of that to it. It's, it's another good piece of content. Who's got some, like, you know, nitty gritty, miserable questions that they have brought in? Um, so, so you're creating, like, three, four, five blog posts a day, right? Sure. Like, where where do you get your inspiration? You know, like, where are you pulling these ideas? Is it just observational stuff that you see, or do you go different places? I mean, yeah, that's a great question. Actually, no, there's a, there's a little bank that we all go to that you don't know about. And uh, <laughs> we just all, we pay in uh, fairy dust, and there's a hundred right there, a hundred blog topics I hope you write. Um, that's my friend Mark Day, by the way. He's so crazy. Um, he doesn't even know why he's on that picture, though. Um, but look, there's some posts right there. How I use Facebooks. Ways I embrace my audience. Should my town use social media? A community I love. Technology that empowers me. How Flickr did it right. And remember, every single one of those is something you can rip apart. My children will do it differently. These are just blog topics, right? But you can see how they're all something to do. I have those all the time, all the time. I could write this post every two weeks and I'll be new. If I were a television producer, I think there's a couple people in the room have an idea on that one. Topics are kind of a dime a dozen, except they're not, because it was a good question. There's a few things to do. One is, you know, we all have smartphones you know, now, or, or dumb phones and a pen and a paper. I write down notes all the time. Uh, you know, I give my iPad to my wife because I ended up not liking the technology. But I bought a MyPad, this is awesome. <laughs> My, look, look at this. The MyPad lets you write in either portrait mode or landscape mode. <laughs> it supports graphics. For like $2 more, you can buy a stylus that allows you to write on it as if you're writing with paper. 
I can bring it closer, or I can tighten it away if I need it, you know. For those of you with a Blackberry eye, you know what I'm doing. It's incredible. Um, I really, I've never been told to shut it off on an airplane. I can do this and no one will shriek. I sit on it most days, which explains how bent and rumply it is. I read a lot of ideas in, the, in this book. I also take a lot of photos that eventually turn into a blog post because I'm just sort of stunned by something. Uh, in the hospital, there was a sign that said, press one to make bed messy. It was a little bit of Spanglish at work. I spent about a good three hours looking at that going, I just want to make my bed messy. <laughs> and I was just thinking, what happens here? Do I do it? And then they're going to come clean it? Or do I just push the button and they'll be like, okay, here you go. Woo the bed's messy. Uh, I just, you know, because you're in a hospital, you've got nothing else to do besides that and watch um, Orange County Choppers, which I didn't know was a real show. I was like, what's Hulk Hogan doing beating up on those two boys? But I didn't know. And uh, I wanted to press one to make bed messy. Um, but there's a blog post in that, you know, use usability, whatever. I mean, that's the other thing is you always have to ask yourself the question, how do I turn this into something my would-be audience really cares about? And then how do I send them on their way with something from it? And I think that's kind of the magic of it all. Oh, yes, now, um, so we focus a lot on you writing. How much time do you dedicate to commenting on other Oh, that's a great question. How much time do you dedicate to commenting on other people's blogs, which answers your question also, how do I find more readers? Um, I spend 30 to 60 minutes a day commenting on other people's blogs, but that's because I know the value and or because I don't want someone going, well, you never comment on my blog. Um, some days I, I fall behind and you know, I'm crappy about it. And then on those days, I try to like or share or do something to give a little bit extra love away. I don't have time. Commenting on blogs is a great way to get traffic if you don't do the jerk baggy thing of putting your URL at the bottom of your comment. Don't do that. Like people know how to find you. Like it's been long enough that we know that if your name is kind of bluish, we can click it and go to your site too. Don't do that thing where you put your URL at the bottom. It makes you look like a jerk to the people who own the site. Um, but if you actually add interesting, relevant comments about other people's stuff, uh, that relates to your site, they're going to want to come find who you are. I mean, I find some of the newer, cooler people that I end up spending time with because they've commented so frequently on my blog that I go follow them. Now I've got this thing going on. I love this. This is like an old David Lee Roth video. Uh, you know, I carry two of them around for conversation, see if there winds up being any. I don't have to be involved. People come onto my site now and comment to my commenters, and I'm not even in it. I'm just watching them. <laughs> well, that was very good, Rob, but you know what I was thinking was, mm, yes, well, absolutely. This is great. I don't have to do anything. I just go get a sandwich. I come back. They're all still having a good old time. It's like a little party. Commenting is important. Is it everything? No. If you're looking for business, if you're just sitting there looking to close a sale, then don't you know? Don't waste your time. Some sites don't even have comments enabled anymore. Like Seth Godin, he hasn't had them for years. Why? Because he doesn't want to answer your questions. So how much? Say so you spend 30, 60 minutes in comments on other people's blogs. How much time a day do you spend on your own blog by reading people's comments? And, and uh, that's a great question. How much time a day do I spend on my own blog commenting and participating? I'm the number one commenter on my blog. If I weren't, then I'd probably be saying something poorly. Um, I don't try to go in and answer everyone's comment. I see a lot of people say, you must one for one with everybody. There's 150 something comments on that. I, I put 30 or 40 of those in. That's a third of them. And still what I feel like is the day I don't comment on somebody's response, they're like, man, I just took all that time to write back to you and you didn't write me anything. <laughs> I'm, I'm like always going to disappoint somebody. It's a Catholic upbringing, I think. Um, but I do spend a lot of time. And again, I'm a little unique. My business is partly tied to my blog. You know what I mean? If I weren't making money off my blog, then I wouldn't spend as much time and love and effort on it. But I do. I, you know, There's a lot of social proof built into the blog. Um, if you're... But I mean, if you're assigning that to somebody, it's a little tricky because what you'll find is that they don't really have their heart in it or they don't want to go back and forth or whatever. So it's kind of one of those forks in the road. You really have to do make a decision that you're going to devote some time to it. I'll tell you this, though, for as much calories as you put into it, you get a lot more back out. The more times you comment and build a relationship, the more someone says, I see. When I'm at these events, like if I go to like a big social media nerd event or something, it's always amazing what people will stop me in the hall and say to me. And they almost always say the same kind of thing. I can't believe you replied back to me. Or I can't believe you commented back on my comment. And like that's the currency. Like that's the level I have to beat to beat all the other people. Oh hell, I own that. 
Because, you know, if they're not even going to be decent enough to respond to somebody, then guess what? There's always still that person who pulls me aside and says, you know, I commented on like 55 of your blog posts and you never wrote back to me. And, you know, I blew it, you know? But it happens. Um, I want to respond to your comment about commenting even the URLs. Sure. So you mean just like right, your just regular website, but what about, say, you know, I read an article and it's very similar to an article I wrote, but doesn't address all the points and putting that link in. I think that's okay. I think that's okay. I mean, if you did it to like every couple of posts or something like that, then there's one of two things. One is, you know, you're dogging my style, don't do that. Two is, um, uh, you know, then you're that guy. Yeah. Oh, oh, I wrote a post like that too, and here it is. But um, if you do it a few times and it's really relevant, I think that's great. Now, on, on my site, I have a <coughs> I have a filter right now that anytime someone adds a URL, that I have to look at and make sure it's okay. That's because for some reason there's a whole bunch of people from Turkey who think my site would be an awesome place to sell Ugg boots and Vibram <laughs> five-toed shoes. I have no idea why, but they're humans. It's not a robot, and they're doing all kinds of really clever things to beat the algorithm. So I just finally, you know, anything that mentions Uggs or Vibrams or whatever, it all just goes in this bucket and I manually fix that. Can you just clarify the point that you are right now? Because, um, I don't know if I can. <laughs> <Okay>. <coughs> what, what I think I heard you say is you're recommending, you know, commenting on other people's sites is a good thing. Yes. But don't put a link, don't put URL back to your site. Well, right, except for in that part where you put your name, your email address, and your website, up there is fine. In the body of the post, don't. And the reason is because you always come off as that jerky person who's just trying to advertise to get people to come to their site. Um, the corollary to this is if you had some kind of a post that had some kind of a value that related to the comment, then yeah, you could say, oh, well, I wrote about something like that. I like how you did it. Here's my, my take on it. That'd be okay. But if you're like, you know, Dave, the, the fly fisher's friend, every single time with the URL, then that's, that's you're, you're kind of advertising, and that's it's just not contributing to the community platform. It's not the same as an email signature, basically. So most bloggers will either take umbrage or at least kind of have you in their not sure you're a good guy category for a long time. How do you uh, keep it fresh in 140 characters, and how do you keep that tight? Oh, what a great question. How do you keep it fresh at 140 characters? How do you keep it tight in? If you can write a good headline, you can write a good tweet. Um, I try to do it in 120 characters. To be really honest, what I do with Twitter is I try to blend absolutely unrelated off-the-wall things with my business interests. Um, and partly because I always want to grab a crowd that doesn't expect me to be part of their crowd, and I want to bring them into my fold. Uh, so I like Jay-Z, I'll quote Jay-Z lyrics every now and again. It's not expected for me to like Jay-Z, so suddenly I get a whole new set of people. And of them, I'll find a few people that are of, of merit. <clears throat> the other thing I do is I promote other people's stuff 12 times as much as I promote my own on Twitter. That way I'm always feeding a network of people who, who know that I'm gonna promote the good stuff. And that brings more people to me because they know that I'm not just talking about myself, I'm talking about other people. So there's a great value in promoting people it's my 12 to 1 rule. <clears throat> that has been the single best way that I grow Twitter following and the single best way that I get people to take a, an action when I ask them for an action. If I say, would you please consider doing this for me, then I get hundreds and hundreds of responses. Um, interestingly, it's still a very low percentage based on the fact that I have 150,000 plus followers. But remember, a good chunk of those are robots and porn stuff. So neither one of which is useful. What about Facebook? I'm, I have almost no great business stories from Facebook. It's never been valuable to me except for the other way, which is I put a big like button. I'm not on a blog post. I am on a blog post. <clears throat> I have the Facebook like button built into my every post. And when you like stuff into Facebook, it means that your audience can possibly potentially convert to being my audience because it shows up on your wall. Um, that has been singularly very useful to me. <clears throat> um, Jim, you had a question in the back. You, know, you spoke a lot about uh, screening out who you want to talk to. And I want to, it's sort of a chicken and egg question. Did you, did you know your audience before you started screening it, or did you start to get the clients you wanted and then say, okay, I don't want those and I don't want those? B, um, you know, a long time ago, it took me eight years to get my first 100 readers. Um, and then it was pretty exponential. Um, what I started to you know, write about for eight years is me. And then when I started writing about others, then I was, suddenly I got an audience. Um, when I started deciding who was going to pay me and who wasn't, 
part of me screening out my audience was, who don't I want to compete with? I don't want to compete with TechCrunch or Mashable. I could care less about the next new Google Buzz or whatever. I've actually technically been right a couple of times against Scoble, because I don't think Buzz is doing anything, and I sure didn't think FriendFeed was. Excuse me. So I keep winning by attrition by tracking the human and not the tech. Um, but you know, of course, he has a different following than I do. What I've also found is that because I write about humans and not about tech, people come to my site for a, very, a varied amount of things, and so I get a varied amount of buyers. I guess tech people are kind of just interested in a gadget. How many times can we all talk about the iPad together before we all either have something to sell or not sell on the iPad? And I kind of don't. I have an iPhone app, but not an iPad app yet. An Android app, maybe. I'm trying to think what else you want to know about content, but if I go to my homepage, I mean, it's really funny because the really blatant first post on my site right now is something I wrote about. Help other people. Help me <coughs> do some stuff. Chris, um, one, another comment um, is I, when I started my blog um, back in this July, one of the things that really um, has helped out is writing about the events that I'm attending. And I've just seen so much more traffic because it's like I'm just brand new to the space. So, but when I write about the event and then say, "Hey, I just wrote this post back at whatever meetup, whatever," it's just getting so much traffic. So there's I don't know if you've had similar experiences. There's a couple of things that are at play there that you can do. We love the sound we love the most in the world is our own name. And if you don't overuse that, it works really well in marketing. If you, you know, say the person's name or you show pictures of the person, they feel it. They, they get that sort of affinity experience. So when you write about an event that you've been to, if you took a picture of all the gang here in the crowd, you, know, you talked about how wonderful it was to spend time with Christine or Jim or whatever, then what you get is that sort of, mm, I feel warm. Um, it's a great value. The other thing you can do is you can do a post that goes on right before you're showing up at the event that if people are Googling to see who's also blogging about the event or blogging about coming to the event, they can find you. I do a lot of business development that way. If I'm going to go to an event and I don't know anyone's going to be there, I'll tend to want to blog about it and tweet the hell out of it because I'm hoping to get caught up in someone's search so I can drag bodies to me at that event. I don't like being a stranger anywhere. And with Twitter and the blogs, I don't think you have to be a stranger anymore. Oddly enough, I was, um, I was doing a Q&A call today with Keith Ferrazzi, the guy who wrote Never Eat Alone which in a lot of ways to me that book is sort of like invalidated by Twitter because you don't have to eat alone anymore. The only thing is you got to read Keith's book because he did it in a really cool clever way and not really, uh, you know, he didn't just talk about Twitter. Any other questions, family jokes? Uh, and then. Uh, you talked a little bit about that, particularly in a business, the business, uh, uh, I run a series of websites that are directed out of your industry. Um, Smaller, big. Okay. Um, LinkedIn has a number of communities or whatever. You know, I'd like to build a community within my web platform. Um, but what do you think might be the best way to get that? Is that a good idea? What do you think the best way to get that spot? Community platforms inside. Uh, BuddyPress makes a tool for it, but that doesn't mean you should use it. Um, the problem. Oh, sorry. I have been repeating. I'm, I'm getting bad at my old age. Uh, I want to build a community. Should I put it on my site? Should I, how do I do something with my community? What do I need to grow it, basically? Um, so the trick with communities is it requires everyone to participate. If they don't, it's sort of that fart in church moment where you're like, hey, everybody, come on, let's do the wave, and nothing happens. You're just the one guy with the hand up. Um, and it's very visible. And the ghost towns left behind by online communities that don't work out are ugly and very visibly like, wow, you stink. You know, and uh, it's almost always the community's fault, not the community maker's fault. You can put the very best tools in front of them, and you can say, this is why, this is a value. And if they don't see it, they won't do it. I mean, so many people are so grudgingly using LinkedIn, and you're kind of like, what? This is like a pulsing, throbbing network of business opportunity, and you're like fighting me on the way to it. And so if they're not using LinkedIn, they're less likely to use your product. If they're using LinkedIn, then you run into the problem, it's sort of what I call the, the hotel room. If you bring a nice oriental rug and you bring your own lamps and you set it up in this uh, hotel room, uh, it's still their hotel. You know what I mean? You're just visiting. So whatever you do to change the decor, whatever you do to make it interesting while you're there, you're just renting. Um, so you don't get a lot of the marketing data. You don't get a lot of the content. You actually are forever at uh, risk of being kicked out for something you don't even know you weren't supposed to do. Um, and one of my clients more recently was Cisco. 
Cisco service provider group, which spoke to telecom engineers. Guess who's not on the social web especially much is telecom engineers, it turns out. Wow, that was a hard project. We were like, look, I found one, I found one. It was like shark hunting or something. It was like, we found an engineer who's on the web. No, he's not. And he's wearing a dress. You know, it was just, it was amazing. And, you know, we didn't get that far. And Cisco didn't pay me a lot of money after that. So, you know, if I found out better, I would. So what's the trick to doing this successfully? Crap, I don't know. Give them a reason why they want to participate. Give them some value to the participation. Make some incentive for them to start participating. Give them uh, tools that make them feel like they can get done what they want. And make it so that there's a reason why they're doing it there instead of email. You know, if they can't get it done in email because it's a collaborative kind of process, then make them the tools that allow them to uh, do what the immortal Rob Van Winkle said, which is stop, collaborate, and listen. Um, so if you're just starting out and maybe, I don't know, since you already had a direction with businesses and such, you, you had a topic, but mm. if you're trying to figure out your voice, how do you determine your topics and, I mean, the hundred things to write about is great, but how do you discover that voice? So you kind of work backwards. And by the way, I, I didn't always know. I mean, in 04, I was writing about fitness. I clearly don't write about fitness anymore. Uh, <laughs> all you have to do is rip a rotator cuff, and then you don't have to care about fitness anymore. Um, I wrote about self-improvement. I wrote about all these other things. But when I finally got my voice, was when people finally started paying me for the same thing I was writing about, um, I think that you could do a bunch of things. One is you could start a blog somewhere else, not even under your name, and just kind of get your feet wet and feel a feel something for it. My, uh, we were doing WordPress.com sites for people where we just let them off and running, and then I'd throw people at it and say, hey, look at this blog I just found, and not really mention that I was going to do that. And then commenters would come and they'd either say, well, that's, you're full of crap, or how come you didn't say this, or whatever, and they got the negative side of blogging, which was really good because they were like, oh, they're attacking my ideas. I was like, wow, welcome to blogging. Um, you know, Julian Smith, the guy that wrote the book with me, Trust Agents, he, he meets people, and if they say they're a blogger, he's like, oh, you're a blogger? What do you complain about? You know, so we're, we're an unsavory lot. We're worse than old-fashioned journalists. Um, but I would say that, you know, you can always experiment. You can always tear it down and start again. I mean, I once had this brilliant idea that I was going to blow my blog up and write five separate blogs. Oh, that lasted like a week. And I was like, oh, what an idiot. What did I do? So there's a bunch of, like, deadblogspot.com blogs out there floating around like little... It's a Voyager. Um, I think that eventually, that was for you, Star Trek friend. Um, <laughs> Vanessa and I have a thing. Um, there's this thing where, you know, once you kind of tumble into the right methodology, then you kind of, then you feel it. it. It's, you know, the angels saying, every, you know, you're like, f forget your kids, whatever. But, you know, that's how it works. You had a question way back when. Um. I know all your affiliate marketing stuff is all products you support and love and recommend, but it's also very aggressive on your site. Yes. And I know some other marketing advice type people um, say don't have any advertising on your site. It distracts from you know your conversions. Um, Absolutely. So what? Just can you talk more about what kind of sites should and shouldn't? go into that world? Sure. Uh, the question is sort of, you, you affiliate market fairly aggressively. A lot of other marketer types say, don't do that. That's too aggressive and you'll lose your message. But look at that. There's four ads right there. Um, oh, that's weird. Should be six. <laughs> Sons of bitches. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I'm missing two. I must have broke something. Um, there should be one for Genesis, and I forget what the sixth one is. That's probably why there's only four. Um, Chris, I've add block up. What's that? I've add block. You jerk bastard. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did those ones get through? Uh, I don't know. That's, That's some good coding right there. That's good. <laughs> I'll fight my way through your ad block. <laughs> Thanks, Kurt. Wow, I was just really like blown for a minute there. Sorry. Um, so my answer is, you know, it kind of depends on your audience. I mean, I've been around for a long time, and I sort of earned my right to do affiliate marketing. The other thing is. The, t the t things I tend to sell tend to be products that service the kind of people who would buy those kinds of, who would I write about? So guest posting, everyone's like, how do I get more traffic? Oh, you guest post, that's how you do it. Who, who do you use for email marketing? I use you know, Blue Sky. No one's ever bought anything off that link. 
I do it because they give me free email service right now. Rackspace Cloud is the people who keep my site alive. And my site's a really high traffic site. When it goes down, it's amazing because I can tweet, dear Rackspace, my site seems to have gone down. Love Chris. Boop, boop, boop. It's back up and running. You know how much cool it is that I can just tweet and they just fix it and I don't have to do anything? Like, it's not because of me either. It's just, they're freaks. They're like so freaks about customer service, but they charge so much money that they should better be freaks. Um, that's so freaky, Kurt. I was just like, whoa, I lost two ads. Um, the other thing I tell the marketers who tell me that is, uh, you can come and feed my kids. I would love that. Come on over, baby. Because you can't eat a hug. Um, and if I were able to show you my Genesis ad, which evidently Kurt has removed my ability to, uh, that one ad pays one to three times my mortgage every month. So my kids will never be living in a dumpster. They might eat out of a dumpster, um, but they will never be living in a dumpster as long as my site gets enough traffic to have enough people buy that WordPress theme. So that really big one at the bottom of all your blog posts? Yeah, well that plus on the side, yeah. So that's my whole mortgage. So, you know, there's a lot of bloggers who also live at their parents' house. And they say that you shouldn't have advertising. You know, and I, I'm just not apologetic anymore. I used to be, but I have too many friends who are out of work. And you know, one in eight of us in the States right now are out of work. If this is a good quality product and I can sell it, then I'm all about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm confused because one of my hesitations for starting a blog was because if it got popular, I wanted to be able to sell ads. And I thought you couldn't on WordPress. Uh, on WordPress.com, you may not. On a hosted WordPress site, you could do most anything you want. You also can't start a porn blog on WordPress.com, I found out. <laughs> um, so yeah, if it's hosted on the WordPress servers, you cannot advertise. If it's hosted wherever you want, you can advertise. That sounds like a service for blogwranglers.com. Uh, Chris, so you, you talked about how you honed your writing for your audience and, and what you're selling on your site, but also clearly you're, you're a writer. Yes. You've written about fitness, and I think you said previously you started out in uh, fiction. Sure. And so I'm just curious if you, you know, if you have any time or interest, if you write other than professionally, if you still endeavor in that anyway, and how much, as a corollary, how much satisfaction are you finding in what you're doing now that you sort of found your voice and mesh that with uh, uh, generate money? So you seem like my friend Darren Daz Cox, who's always asking me, why don't I write for my right brain anymore? And I said, because my left brain likes eating. And um, the question was sort of like, you know, I, I, let me just paraphrase and make sure I get it right. It's uh, how much of my writing isn't for blood sucking and money, and how much of it's just for love and passion. And, and there's a second part that I forgot. I don't know if, there's a, if you're off to the side, if you're <coughs> writing in a in a journal at night, gotcha. anything else, just for your own pleasure. Gotcha, pleasure. I remember pleasure. Um, I think, that's why we invented porn. Um, I, I'm, I'm planning on some fiction. I have an idea for a story, so I'm a dad, supposedly, and I wanted to write a story about like just how bad a dad I am, and I figured I'd write it from the perspective of the day I died. Um, so I plan to write a book like that, and I happen to be chummy with a lot of publishing houses who are really anxious to see that one out sooner than later. Uh, but frankly, I, I think it'll kind of mess up all the other stuff I'm doing. The, um, I do write for pleasure, but a lot of what I write is pleasurable to me. You know, I get to go to Maker's Mark headquarters and, and meet the assistant brewmaster and stick my hand in the mash and stuff like that. And I get to test drive the new Camaro like a week and a half before it was out. So that's pleasurable, but it's not fiction and it's not, not for yield. Um, I do that a little bit. I did some fan fiction type stuff, uh, genre stuff. I'm a comic book kind of guy, so I did a lot of that. But you know, you gotta you gotta cut your hobbies every now and again while you're doing a lot of work, and you know, it's either sleep or uh, do that or play guitar, sir. And then you, please. Uh, guest posting. When does it start diluting your brand? Yes, I have too many guest posts. I've got one that I follow, and the original guy has virtually disappeared. And everybody's guest posting, I'm saying, why am I here? Right. Well, see, I made fun of Brian Clark about that twice today in the same phone call. Copy blogger. Uh, he doesn't write for copy blogger as much. There you go. I, I made fun of him. I said, dude, remember when you used to blog? 
And, uh, you know, but he just merged four companies into one, so he's even less uh, available than he used to be. Plus, he may or may not be reading some stuff that he says may or may not be involved in a book. Um, uh, you know, I have a trouble with that. You know, that's why I stopped taking guest posts on chrisbrogan.com, because for a while I had a bunch, and people were like, I came here to review. And that's all I had to hear once, and I was like, oh, forget that. I'm, I'm off the wagon here. But I think that... Um, you know, I'm not sure the I'm not sure the timing of that, but I would I would like to say that you should try to have like you know five or six posts of you to every guest. But then there's there's group blogs. I started one called Escape Velocity, which is at myescapevelocity.com, where I'm just one of a chorus. And that's kind of that's a little more fun. Anything more to say about content yes. that aren't words? One that more time. Con content that isn't words. Do you have anything to say about that? Most of what we do that where I work, we don't traffic in words, or we do, but their briefings and papers, and they're not blog posts. Uh, you traffic someplace where there's not words. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, they are words, but that's not all of our content. We might have videos. I love videos. Videos are great. Um, so in my last 10 posts, I was just looking to see what I could see about myself. Because if you ever go back and look at your last 10 posts, it'll tell you a lot about you. It's usually not anything positive. Um, but I have two video book reviews right in the next little while. I actually have so many more to put up because I got a chance to read a lot in the hospital and on a couple airplanes. Um, and also, riffing off of the famous, I'm on a boat, I'm on a tank. Um, I think videos are great. Google can't see videos very well, so you need to have words around them, maybe two or 300 words per post. Uh, but there's, there's visual themes too. Uh, Genesis, that's the site I promote a lot, has a theme called Landscape. That's all just graphics. It's good for pictures and for art. So there's uh, a lot of opportunity to use just uh, graphics or photos. There's lots of photo blogging sites. And then there's lots of sites that are doing blogging for different kinds of things that aren't this kind of blogging. There's like you know geotagging blogging where it's nothing but location data and stuff like that. I can't really talk to that very well because I'm not, no, no, no articles of things that I own are actually somewhere I don't know where they are unless it's a surprise to me. Like I'm hoping the car's still in the garage, that kind of a thing. Um, what are the top three metrics you watch every day, or every week, or whatever for your blog? Uh, the top three metrics I look at for my blog, uh, I'm kind of easygoing. I, I tend to look for my uh, daily views. I look at what the hottest story I are for a certain day. I look at my click-throughs. That's the number one thing I'm looking for, is where are people going when they're done the post? And on a day where they all go to like subscribe to my blog, I'm like, Gah, bad day, um, I, you know, because I'm not making money off them. But uh, and I'm really not just a money grubber, I promise. Yes, I am. No, I'm not. Uh, and then the other thing I'm looking for is, you know, referral sites. Like, from where did this traffic go? Because sometimes I'm always amazed that I have to rush out and go, whoa, I had no idea that I had a following here, and I go over there. Uh, that Twitter post, 50 Ways to Use Twitter for Business, uh, is referred to at the Twitter.com website, and I get a huge amount of traffic from it. And that goofy <coughs> Add H button, I get traffic from, did I die? My battery died. <laughs> I've outlasted the battery. <laughs> Time I should go. <laughs> That's not going to work. People of Earth. If I didn't have a cold, I could just belt it out, but I kind of go, look, there's everything. He's pulling mics out of everything. I can't really beatbox very well, although I always wanted to be able to do so. Any question over here I forgot? No? You forgot your question, sir? Yes. What? You can go first. We already had it. What do you think of Kajabi? I've had that once with some rice and it's delicious. <laughs> what? <coughs> K Kajabi? Kajabi. I got nothing. Two weeks ago, it came out, it's like, they call it some game changer for marketing with the software that you... Um, Does anyone else raise your hand that you've heard of Kajabi? All right, no, I got nothing. I don't know, I don't think very much of it, evidently. <laughs> wow, that's changing everything. No, I, I'm not. I'm not making fun of you. I'm making fun of me. I, I've never heard of that. Okay. Um, I, you know. How do you spell? I learned. K A J A B I. K 
Kajabi. Uh, I still don't know. Kajabi. I'll go look. Yeah, it's a, it's a whole package for internet marketing, um, making a website, and funneling a product, and you know, making money. And, you know, oh, one of those. Charge a lot for it. Yeah. But it's um, mm -hmm. all, the, all, all in one, all inclusive package. Yeah, you know what? There's a, there's a big push for people to want all-in-one things. I've never been a fan of all-in-one. Like, I like my car to be separate from my house. Um, <laughs> I'm a big fan of my keys opening the door instead of my phone. You know, so I'm not a fan of all-in-one in internet marketing. I mean, I'm kind of being funny about that, but I'm also being very serious about it. Uh, collaborative tools do this all the time. It's like, you know, we do all these different things. We're Microsoft SharePoint. So. <laughs> you know, I'm a big fan of uh, I'm a big fan of some tools work better than other tools, and you know that's how it goes. But I think that you know Microsoft Office works exceptionally well together, so that's a great all-in-one example. And you know Windows Seven, how it advanced it, this is my ad for Microsoft to make fun of them. Um, I think is really positive, but I think there's a lot of times where it's not as valuable. And uh, I've seen lots of all-in-one sites like that that really do a great job of making money for the person who sells that product. So I can't speak too intelligently on that, but that's about all I got for you. Should you embrace or avoid controversial subjects? Have you done so? Have you seen backlash oh. because you posted something that people found controversial? Controversy. Prince song. Way back in the day, before he was a symbol. Um, should you embrace controversial things? I mean, if, if you've got some value to add to it, I mean, the, the kind of person, you know, so David Mirman Scott has a new book out in real-time marketing and PR, and one of the things he likes to quote is that within moments of Paris Hilton getting caught with cocaine again, the wind in Vegas said, oh, she's banned from the properties from here on out. Like, it had nothing to do with them, but because they did that, it got all this news, and tons of people covered it, like, the wind reports Paris Hilton can't stay there anymore. I said, but man, I wish I were faster, because I would have said she can't come to my house. <laughs> Flat out, not anymore. <laughs> Don't want her teaching my kids about that cocaine stuff. <laughs> teaching them about speed. Um, but man, you know, he was calling that great marketing, but I, I call it like jerky marketing, you know, because, you know, that's not, I mean, it had nothing to do with him. But, you know, they got a lot of press and I didn't, so. <laughs> Um, every year around Super Bowl season, I make an advertisement that you could spend 300000 with me for an entire year, and that's one zero less than the 30 seconds you pay for at the Super Bowl. So far, no one. But one of these days, maybe I'm going to hook that shark and pull it in. I'm going to need a bigger boat. I'm not big on it. Two minutes or peace? Peace, my brother. You've, been, you've had a lot of success marketing yourself and your products through Twitter. Um, you almost have to kind of separate your blog from Twitter, though, in a sense that everybody's always looking for that next big social marketing program or software thing that's going to come along and replace Twitter, and you don't want your site left behind because it was too attached to Twitter? Right. It's a great question. So um, how attached can I be to Twitter in case the next big thing comes along? And to me, email's been around for 30 years, so I'm making email sort of my last bastion. Um, but I think that I have I have a premise that I call home bases and outposts and passports. My home base is my blog. The outpost is something like Twitter. I spend just as much time on LinkedIn. I just don't talk about it. By the way, it's really funny because we keep talking about how I market myself. I do a lot of marketing for other companies. I just don't brag about it because it's it's kind of lame, you know, to look at my my clients' work or whatever. Uh, besides, I make more money on myself uh, than I make on them. But I think that. You know, to your point, what if Twitter goes away? If Twitter goes away, I do have a problem right now because I've, my search results in Google are lower on my referring traffic than Twitter, by far. So right now, Twitter gives me something like 50-something percent of my traffic and Google gives me 30-something percent of my traffic. So, uh, you know, I know where my bread's buttered. Um, but if I, I guess looking forward, I do stuff like email marketing and all that, and I, and I try to keep people to a list, and you live or die by your database, was advice I got from Jeff Paul, but the second piece of advice I got when he hired me in 07, and it's uh, still been useful advice to this day. Parents get ready to pull the plug, and uh, oh, one last question from the, on the fade. Yeah, uh, what were the passports? Oh, passports, oh, oh sorry, I, I only did half of my thing. Uh, home base is your blog, outposts are places where you feel like having a participation. Passports are having accounts for sites you may or may not plan to use. If you don't have a YouTube account and someone's crapping on your YouTube video or whatever and you don't have a way to talk back to them, 
If you don't have a WordPress.com account, if you don't have a WordPress site, you need a passport to kind of get you into that land. Or you should have a Twitter account even if you're not sure you want to participate. Because if you just show up that brand new day with the, you know, the fake icon head and you know, it's obvious you just joined that day to complain uh, or fight back against a complaint, then you don't really look like a participant in that community. So passports are you know, access to those sites that you didn't necessarily think you should have. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for dealing with my froggy voice. I'm Chris Brooks.